Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest, publisher of Lawfare. This week, historian and former national security official Will Inboden reassessing Reagan's foreign policy. Reagan hands Gorbachev a list of 12 more Jewish refuseniks in the Soviet Union. He says, hey, can you please let them out of prison? And, and Gorbachev agrees to do it. There's no political gain to be had at all. And yet Reagan was so personally committed to that issue that he still uses that last couple weeks in office. Let's get 12 more people free. As you may recall, in the photo section of the book, I have this anti-Reagan poster. Uh, and that poster hung on my bedroom wall in my high school years. I hope readers who are themselves still more critical of him or not favorably inclined will read it with an open mind and know that the author at least knows what it is like to be a critic of Reagan because I once was one myself and I think those criticisms need to be taken seriously if, even if ultimately I've changed my views. Will, welcome to Chatter. Thanks, David. It's great to be with you. It is great to talk to you again. It's been a while. The pandemic uh, certainly wasn't good for us getting together, but it is a joy to be talking to you upon the publication of your new book, The Peacemaker, Ronald Reagan, The Cold War, and The World on the Brink. You've been working on this for a while, and I don't just mean the writing of it or even the research of it, but even the, the thinking about it, the whole idea of doing it. Take us back a bit. Take us back to why you thought many years ago now, why you thought that Reagan's national security policy needed a reexamination. Yeah, um, it, it has been a, a long gestating project. Uh, my, I was realizing the other day, my first research trip to the Reagan Library uh, on this book was a decade ago. It was the fall of uh, two, 2012. So um, uh, although, as you, oh. as you mentioned, some of the thinking about it or origins of it were, were, were even earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I would say there's a couple strains that uh, merged in my own you know, life and thinking uh, to, to form the, the basis and the birth of this book. One was, you know, my previous time as a policymaker, um, the State Department and National Security Council staff, especially in the George W. Bush administration, uh, you know, our focus then in the early 2000s, of course, was the uh, the war on the war on terror, but also you know some bigger picture thinking about uh, America's role in the world in the 21st century. Uh, some early looking at what seemed to be some inchoate troubling signs from from China and Russia and so on. And I, uh, while working on strategy at the NSC at that time, uh, started just on the side taking some looks back to what seemed to be the last presidential administration to have, um, you know, uh, encountered this challenge of emerging great power competition uh, mm -hmm. and ideological mm -hmm. uh, contest as well uh, with the totalitarian power. Uh, and that was, of course, the Reagan administration. And so I uh, started dabbling a little bit, just taking a uh, the beginnings of a look back at, in my role as a policymaker on uh, what had been the Reagan administration's overall strategy in the Cold War and how they how they put put it together. And at that time, um, some of the main strategy documents which appear in the book NSDD thirty two NSDD seventy five for any specialists out there uh, had recently been recently been de declassified and, and scholars were starting to take a look at those. Um, so I, I had no notion at the time I'm going to write a book on this, but that's when some of the early early thinking began on how can I as a policymaker uh, mm -hmm. go back and learn from uh, one of our uh, pretty accomplished predecessors. Uh, then fast forward a few years, uh, it's now. Um, 2011, 2012, I've joined the faculty here at the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm you know, starting to think about uh, the next you know book project I want to I want to undertake, and was initially looking at the National Security Council, kind of in a higher history of the National Security Council from its you know, creation and under Truman at the beginning of the Cold War on forward, and that's when I took that research trip to the to the Reagan Library in the fall of 2012, just wanting to look at the functioning or sometimes dysfunction of the of the Reagan NSC. But while out there, I just uncovered that there was this emerging wave of newly declassified archival documents uh, from the Reagan years, you know, declassified CIA assessments, declassified meetings, um, minutes of NSC meetings, um, uh, declassified deliberative documents on, on the strategies, and realized that even though a number of very good books had already been written on uh, the Reagan administration, biographies of him, his Cold War policy, that there was this abundance of new research uh, material becoming available. And 
a, a book had not yet been written uh, with a comprehensive overview of all aspects of his foreign policy. There was also mm-hmm. a lot of new mm-hmm. material coming out on his Asia policy, for example, his counterterrorism policy, uh, uh, his, his, his Middle East policy. Um, and I also just realized as the, you know, as our lifespans are and as actu- actuarial tables work that um, uh, there were quite a few people who had served in senior roles in the Reagan administration who are still alive and available for interviews and would not be with us forever as none of us will be here, uh, be here forever. And so that convergence of these newly available documents, um, the and yet enough recency that uh, first person interviews are still available mm. and and then uh, Seeming there seemed to be this intellectual space, this opportunity to do a you know, relatively new type of book, uh, synthesizing all aspects of the Reagan administration foreign policy. That all those came together. I decided, okay, this is this is the book I'm going to write. And from there, it still took another decade of the research and writing. Of course, there, there's a few interesting threads there that that I want to pull on. Uh, one is the last one you mentioned, which is the there's this idealized view of political history, which <laughs> is there's an idea that seizes you. Maybe you find some documents or you talk to someone interesting and it, and it lights that fire and then you explore it. You find interesting things to say, you produce it. But th- there is that element of reality of how do you get access to people and h- how do you get access to people who are, frankly, you know, dying um, mm-hmm. in time to do a project. So if you're doing the Obama administration or the Trump years, not too much of a problem mm-hmm. if you're doing... Eisenhower, Kennedy, you're already in trouble. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing something from Johnson or even Nixon forward, if you're thinking of doing a project, you got to jump on it because you you don't have it. I mean, some of the people I interviewed about the Reagan administration for my first book, a lot of them have died in the last 10 years. And I can think both of our, our research, both of our research projects would have been much more limited without access to some of those people, right? Yeah, yeah. No, just, I mean, in, in my case, um, I can think of at least seven uh, people I interviewed uh, for the Reagan book who have died in the last last few years. I mean, George Schultz, yeah, Colin huge, Powell, huge. Bud, Mc, Bud McFarlane, Frank mm-hmm. Carlucci. Uh, mm-hmm. So, it, yeah, it was, um, I interviewed Carlucci just about six or eight weeks before before he died. So, um, yeah. yeah, so those were those were power, powerful moments. Yeah. And another, I'm, I'm glad I was able to get to them in time. Yeah. Another, another thread I want to pull is you mentioned your work in, in the government. And mm-hmm. if I recall right, you were on the policy planning staff at, at State, and you were yeah. also a senior director at the National Security Council staff, yeah. both of those in the George W. Bush years? Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah. Now, the George W. Bush years, I don't know how to say this, but generally the National Security Council process worked. That is, you had people in it who had been in it before, they, they, they knew how it worked. Some of them had worked under uh, George H.W. Bush and Brent Scowcroft, the gold standard of the NSC process. Um, mm-hmm. So that was your personal experience. Mm-hmm. And yet, when you are reflecting back on the Reagan years, um, you find something quite different. I'm wondering mm-hmm. how conscious of that you were when you were in those jobs, that in fact, you were in a system as frustrating as it could be and as many mm-hmm. challenges that came up that a system that actually had a sense of order and discipline compared to what happened far too often back in the Reagan years? Yeah, and no, a great question, David. There's there's a lot there, and I um, a couple of strands I want to want to pick pick up on. Um, first, I am uh, you know very. Uh, Proud of my service in the Bush administration, was honored to serve there. Um, uh, you know, we can do a whole another discussion sometime on the complicated legacy of the Bush administration. Uh, my assessment from having served through it is, yeah, there were some very capable senior senior leaders in the administration. the The NSC process, I think, overall. Uh, uh, worked better in Bush's second term uh, once you had Condi over at State and Steve Hadley as National yep. Security Advisor and then yep. Bob Gates coming in as Secretary of Defense. Uh, there was still a decent amount of, uh, I think, you know, feuding and acrimony in the, in the, first, in the first term, um, uh, you know, particularly say Cheney and Rumsfeld against Powell, I think, think things like that. Uh, I, my time on the NSC staff was in that second term under Steve Hadley, uh, who I you know, still think of as one of the greatest national security advisors in history. So here was one of the immediate strains of that time that um, planted a seed of what leads to the Reagan book is 
Uh, Steve was very emphatic for all of us serving on the NSC staff that the NSC's job is to coordinate the interagency, but we are not uh, to be operational. Uh, you know, we are not to be, do, you know, obviously doing our own on freelance and a policy. And he would often reference his service as uh, one of the uh, councils on the Tower Commission uh, trying to clean up the carnage of the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, and that had been a very formative time for him as a much younger lawyer. Uh, that's when he had first become close to Brent Scowcroft, of course, who was, um, you know, one of the three Tower Commission commissioners. And so the you know one of my first exposures as a policymaker, like I said, to the legacy of uh, Reagan's NSC dysfunction was Steve Hadley having taken those very clear lessons uh, from his you know his time in the Tower Commission to how he was running running the the, the NSC, and in some of my early research on what led to this book, that was one of the puzzles I was trying to wrestle through is this paradox of what I called it in an article, uh, organizational dysfunction and strategic success. Cause that was, you know, part of my verdict on the Reagan administration is look, this NSC process was for the most part a mess, right? He's got six national security advisors in, in eight years. Um, of course, you have the, the Iran-Contra scandal. And yet I, you know, was persuaded and hope my, most of my readers are persuaded that, the Reagan administration had some tremendous strategic successes, of course, foremost being you know, a peaceful victory in, in the Cold War, but also, I think, some really positive uh, 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 legacies and transformations in our posture in, in Asia, for example. And we can we can talk about that later. And uh, so as I was exploring that uh I didn't come to a neat and tidy conclusion on how that happened, but you know some of the main takeaways were first where Reagan himself would become personally involved and deeply committed on a policy, especially say his, his anti-Soviet policies. Uh, he was still able to make uh, make drive the policy process and make things work, even with an acrimonious feuding NSC, with state and DOD at, at each other's throats, with, you know, the, the, the NSC itself, be, you know, not, not doing a very good job of interagency coordination, so on and so forth. And then the second follow on from that, especially from his second term, is when he made, he never explicitly stated this, but it's very clear from the evidence, he made a choice to put, to make the State Department first among equals. Yeah, um, absolutely. That he picked, yeah, George Schultz as his key partner uh, in his diplomatic uh, efforts and outreach to the Soviet Union, integrating it, by the way, with force and the threat of force. OK, so this is, you know, that, that's an important part of the part, part of the argument here. But uh, he Reagan almost makes this implicit choice that with this, you know, feuding and acrimonious interagency, I'm going to primarily side with the State Department and uh, and Secretary of State Schultz is going to be my my key partner in de devising and implementing my, my strategy. But along the way, you know, there's uh, there's, you know, an incredible, uh, you know, certainly dysfunction and carnage, like I said, exemplified with Iran Contra, but also with a lot of leaking uh, with uh, certainly amounts of uh, you know confusion and, and friction on arms control and other aspects of, of so Soviet policy. And overall, you know, Reagan's in the aggregate, Reagan's national security advisors are not a terribly distinguished group. You know, you don't have a. Kissinger or a Scowcroft or a Hadley for that uh, merging among them. But I do have a somewhat of a revisionist take uh, in the book, as you'll know, on Bill Clark, his second national security advisor in the really the most critical years of 1982 and 83, who, even though he was not a foreign policy specialist, uh, was a very capable manager, was loyal to Reagan, uh, and played a key role in implementing some of Reagan's strategic vision. Yep. And then also have to give credit to uh, Frank Carlucci and Colin Powell, the last two national security advisors after Iran Contra, yep. who really helped to implement what becomes the Scowcroft system and mm -hmm. at least get it to be functioning a little bit more. Even yep. if at that point there was not much, nothing major to be done in strategy development that had already been done earlier. So it's, um, it's so interesting. We'll probably get to this as we talk about some of the details, but there's mm -hmm. two two key variables there, which is the people, right? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter how good the actual process um, and environment is when you have Al Haig in it, because he's probably yeah. going to blow up that process. Whereas yeah. Yeah. you can have people who are not skilled at some of the process. You can have people who are not necessarily experienced in a functioning NSC, but if you do have a good process, um, it does make them better. And you, you kind of have to have both working at least at, at some level. But yeah. that's that's some interesting background. The the other thread I didn't want to lose is in your in your opening comments talking about the the overall importance of Reagan. 
and we've spoken with others, including, you know, Ben Griffin, um, who wrote the book on Reagan. My, my and former the, PhD student, yeah. <laughs> the, the influence yeah. of um, specific books and authors mm-hmm. on him and vice versa. Um, Reagan's cultural importance, Reagan's position, when we, when we talk about it in terms of national security, um, of course, there's Dwight Eisenhower, whose national security importance was uh, basically signed, sealed, and delivered before he became president, but then he did even more as president. And then, of course, we talk about 9-11 in the world and how it changed after that. But for people of our generation, and we won't talk about our exact ages, but we're roughly similar in age, we we didn't grow up reading treatises on foreign policy and national security. Um, we grew up watching the television as kids, and the first president that both of us were probably aware of as president was Ronald Reagan. Yeah. And I'm curious for you, what memories you have that influenced you, um, if you can reflect on your own psychology, which is hard for all yeah. of us, kind of how did you grow up seeing politics and seeing Ronald Reagan and first becoming aware that there was this thing called foreign policy? And how much do you think that stuck with you because he was such an iconic figure? Yeah, no, it's a great question, David. And I, I yeah, a number of reflections uh, there. Um, so I, um, uh, and I'm, uh, so I grew up in Tucson, Arizona in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, in the Reagan years, I was primarily in junior high and, and, and high school. Um, uh, the first thing to say about my you know, formative years is uh, Tucson, for any of our listeners who have been there, and I hope you have a chance to visit, is surrounded by four mountain ranges. And during the Cold War, those mountain ranges uh, contained about 30 or 40 Titan missile silos. You know, they were buried deep in, deep in the mountains. You know, no one knew where they were, but we all knew that those nuclear, those ICBMs, those nuclear missiles were surrounding our, our fair city. And it also meant that Tucson was very high on the Kremlin's targeting list. Should there, you know, heaven forbid, have been a, a, a nuclear exchange, an outbreak of nuclear war, Tucson almost certainly would have been incinerated, uh, you know, as, you know, alongside Washington, D.C. and other key uh, strategic places. And so, even though I had a you know, pretty happy childhood overall growing up, there was a, in a the, kind of this constant low-level sense of dread or terror that you know our, our world could be extinguished in, in in a moment just by you know virtue of where we are and and the Air Force's you know under understandable decision to base these base these missiles there. Um, so uh, I uh, some of my earliest uh, political memories are you know Reagan's election in 1980 and then. Um, and then, of course, you know, watching him on the evening news and uh, I as much as I had any political views or opinions at the time, I was very much a kid of the left. You know, I, I detested Reagan. I thought he was a warmonger who was going to get us into a nuclear war. I was very opposed to his Central America policies and Tucson's just an hour north of the Mexican border. Uh, so these were, you know, these were more present in, in our backyard. Uh, as you may recall, in the photo section of the book, I have this, I include this um, anti-Reagan poster uh, making fun of his name. The anagram Ronald Wilson Reagan translates uh, do letter for letter, insane Anglo warlord. Uh, and that poster hung on my bedroom wall in my high school years. Um, so I was, uh, like I said, so that's what my convictions were. Now, I, I'm not terribly informed about all this, right? I'm not reading foreign policy treatises, but, uh, you know, I had uh, that that terror of terror of the Cold War and, uh, you know, very strong uh, anti-Reagan views. Um, mm-hmm. And I include that poster in the book because, of course, as you know, readers will see in the book, my views changed. They evolved over time. Um Partly with the peaceful, uh, you know, end of the Cold War on favorable terms to the United States. Uh, partly with uh, my own time as a policymaker, uh, looking back and appreciating um, that you know policies I was critical of as a high schooler turns out to have I think worked pretty well, or at least have been the the least bad options for for for, for the Reagan administration. Um, so I. Uh, and the book is again an overall very favorable assessment of Reagan, but it uh, it certainly includes uh, you know war- warts and all, and I'm you know quite critical of where I think some of his deficiencies and, and li- liabilities were, and I hope readers who uh, are themselves still more critical of him or not favorably inclined will read it with an open mind and know that the author at least knows what it is like to be a critic or re- re- opponent of Reagan because I, I wa- once was one myself, and I think those those criticisms need to be taken seriously, if sure. al- even if ultimately I've. I've changed, I've changed my views. So, yeah. Sure. So in that sense, going back to your first question on the podcast, maybe the origins of this book go back 35 years. Interesting, <laughs> so, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's get into some of the, the research and, and writing you've done on Reagan. Really, you've reassessed 
his national security policy, foreign policy overall. But you you start before his presidency and you start with his basically formation of his foreign policy advisory team during the campaign. I think it's fair to say that with the exception of George H. W. Bush in 1987, 1988, um, in our lifetime, presidents who have been campaigning and ultimately won the presidency are not people who had fully formulated policy papers in their head about various places around the world. That's just not true, whether it's a senator running, a governor running, um, or someone else. Um, so Reagan did have some ideas. He had some very firm ideas about some very important things, but he didn't have all of the players because he wasn't in a position where he needed to build that team. As he was building that team, what were the things he did that were a little bit different, maybe a little bit unique that most people don't know about or have forgotten? Yeah, and no, I really appreciate you asking this and I uh, uh, um, need to emphasize that uh, while the book is a long book uh, and readers might be you know, a little put up by that, the first draft of it uh, was almost twice as long uh, and I had to cut out about 100,000 words, which are very painful, including a couple of, uh, a couple of chapters that I, I had written much more extensively on the 60s and 70s, the background before Reagan came, came into office. So there's very little bit of that still included, but this gives me a chance to reflect a little bit. A little bit more. Um, I think the first thing that came out in my research is uh, Reagan's Cold War foreign policy worldview and convictions at the, in the big picture really are formed, I think, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, his obviously his firm anti-Soviet stance, but also his belief in the Soviet Union's vulnerability. We even see some you know, statements from him in the early mid 60s, uh, you know, speculating, hey, I think if we bring enough pressure to bear on this system, it may it may crack apart. Right. But also uh, his uh, his horror of nuclear weapons, his nuclear abolitionism. You know, our mutual friend Paul Leto has written, you know, still the authoritative book on, on that, which I benefited from quite a bit in the research for this one uh, and his his belief in freedom. Uh, and I don't mean that as a trite cliche, but really his his belief in you know the virtues of freedom, uh, both as a, a solvent or counter to uh, totalitarianism, to Soviet communism, and also as a good in its own right uh, for 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 the free world. And we can talk a little bit more about what that what that means. Um, and this is where you know looking at Reagan's you know his op eds, his writings, his radio addresses in the 1970s, you know when he's out of office but preparing to run again for for president, you find a lot of the threads there of his um what becomes his 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 strategy when he's in office but as you pointed out he's largely doing not that on his own he doesn't have an extensive team of advisors and once his campaign does does get in gear uh you know when he from particularly when he announces in november 79 over the next few months he very quickly assembles a very capable team and you know a couple a couple themes that jump out on that first uh the overwhelming number of intellectuals on his team uh, so I, I'm, the, I have the exact numbers in the books. So I'm doing this from memory, but something like when he first announces, you know, a few months into the campaign, you know, it's the press release. Here's my team of about, you know, 60 foreign policy advisors advising me on the range of issues. Something like 48 of them have PhDs, um, and a considerable number of those are, you know, tenured professors at, at Harvard, Stanford, Georgetown, um, and so even though Reagan himself is not an intellectual, he is. I think it's safe to say a man of ideas. He approaches the Cold War as a battle of ideas and foreign policy specialists who are committed to ideas are very drawn to him. And right. so that was, that was right. really, I was, uh, I was really, really struck by that. And you, you see that again, carrying out in his, in his administration. The other big theme is how uh, so many Democrats are initially drawn to him. Um, this is of course the early wave of the first generation of neoconservatives. And I almost bring up that term with some hesitation because it, it means something very different now than it did back then. But at the time, you know, uh, oversimplification is it, it was hawkish Democrats. It was a, uh, Democrats who are, you know, much more on the left or center left on, you know, domestic and social policy, but who took a more hawkish firm line on foreign policy. And they did not like what their party was becoming in the 70s under McGovern and then and then J Jimmy Carter. And so they were very drawn to the Reagan campaign as well. He himself, of course, had been a former Democrat. He had only become a Republican in, uh, I think, 1964, 65. Um, and, uh, and they were very drawn to his commitment to human rights. Uh, 
uh, to press in the Soviet Union on the plights of you know Jews, Jews and Christians, uh, and to a more hawkish stance overall. And so this is where Jean Kirkpatrick, Elliot Abrams, uh, Jean Jean Rostow, uh, Paul Paul Nitze, um, uh, I you know I, I could go on. Uh, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, a you know a, a considerable array of Democrats who had served in Democratic administrations previously. Right, these are you know real Democrats, not just not nominal ones. Joined the Reagan Reagan team as well, and so it's a, it's a very interesting moment in American political history. So he comes into office, and he definitely has some very I don't know how to describe this. Uh, you've described it in the book very well, but some very well set views, some very firm views on the big important things, right? That the the Soviet Union is not just, you know, an evil empire, a phrase he ended up using, um, but it is destined to fail. And it's destined mm-hmm. to fail because of human nature um, and because of faith and a number of reasons. So he has that idea, but he does not yet have a a set formula that is, uh, you know, translating the vision to the strategy, to the tactics of foreign policy. And there are quite a few speed bumps in those first few years, both uh, within the administration and with allies. And I'm wondering if you can characterize in a, in a general sense with some examples as you'd like, those first few years, let's say going up to about 1983, um, what did Reagan in particular learn from that? And how did his vision of foreign policy start translating into actual action? Yeah. Okay. Um, great question. Again, there's a lot there. I'll try to hit some of the highlights as you as you ask. So first, on Reagan himself, I, I I am convinced from the research, and you know, readers can decide for themselves as if they if they read the book um, that he arrives in office with, as you highlighted, some clear convictions about the Cold War. I'll, you know, just highlight a few of the the key ones there. First, he assesses the Soviet Union to be a unique uniquely perverse combination of strong and weak. It's at the apex of its military might. That's its that's its strength. And so it's, he sees it, you know, this is the window of maximum vulnerability is a phrase he sometimes uses, right? Um, and so that's why he's very hawkish on the need for a defense buildup and deterring them. But he also, and he's rather unique among, uh, you know, American political figures or, or foreign policy ends of the time, sees the Soviet Union as very weak and brittle. He thinks that this system is very vulnerable. The, the economy is more abundant. It has no political legitimacy. And he thinks that it can be uh, collapsed. He's, by, he's quite clear, clear about that. Um, in hindsight, we see he was correct, but that was a wildly heterodox opinion at the time. Uh, second, he comes in with, based on that uh, you know, theory of the case, if you will, that strategic assessment of the Soviet Union, he comes in with this uh, plan for a dual track policy of pressure and outreach. And I think this is pretty consistent throughout his eight years of wanting to press that system, to expose its vulnerabilities, to weaken it, to try to bring it down, but also consistent diplomatic outreach. He wants to keep the Cold War cold. He does not want this to turn into a hot war because of his terror of, of new nuclear weapons. And he comes into office with a conviction that allies are a key source of American strength. Uh, he's very much a child of the, the World War II generation. Um, you know, the, the first, you know, kind of great instance of America's partnership with uh, with other other allies to defeat totalitarianism. Uh, and, and he, in turn, is very committed to, to allies. But there's a problem, as you point out. Um, it's even though he has these ideas, because he's a rather indifferent or not not very devoted manager, even though he brings in some very capable, talented people on his team, he doesn't clearly communicate his strategic convictions to them, nor do all of they necessarily share those convictions. And so uh, translating Reagan's strategic principles into actual policies and blueprints is just not done very much at all in those first couple of years. And there's, you know, tremendous amount of feuding and, and, and fighting on, on that. The other challenge, of course, is, you know, as a good politician, Reagan is mindful of the need to, you know, tend to your, um, tend to your, your own people first, tend to your needs at home. And here inherits the United, uh, United States in a terrible economic recession, right? You know, um, yeah. And that per- toxic combination of inflation and unemployment called stagflation. Mm-hmm. And so during his first year in office, even though he makes a couple of foreign policy statements and starts doing a little bit in foreign policy, he's very deliberately focused on restoring the American economy. He knows that he needs to do that for the sake of his political support with voters. And also, if he's going to get the resources to you know fund his defense buildup uh, and a more assertive uh, internationalist for- for- foreign policy. And so that is another area... Uh, I don't want to say benign neglect, but where he is not 
as focused on foreign policy and translating his ideas into uh, you know specific policy lines, particularly in that in that first year. That starts even, to change. But even there, will. Even yeah. there, there is that foreign policy angle. You slipped it in there, but the idea is in order to be successful abroad, you, you have to be strong at home. Yeah. And I think it was Richard Nixon, who, of course, had a tricky relationship with Reagan um, through the, the 60s and 70s. But in, in writing a letter to Reagan as he took office, basically gave him that advice saying, yeah. hey, look, you, you got to handle the economy. You got to get the situation set at home. And it was from a national security point of view saying that is what you need to do first. And certainly the Reagan Nixon relationship changed a bit when Reagan was president as he took him on almost as a, a distant advisor of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I'm, I'm glad, glad you highlight that because even though they'd been, you know, fierce political rivals and continue to have their big differences, they, they forge a certain uh, rapprochement and even closeness when Reagan's in office. And yeah. That is, you know, Nixon writes that fascinating 12 page letter to Reagan during the transition with personnel advice and policy advice. And one of those big principles is focus on the economy first, you know, for your political standing and for the sake of your foreign policy. Now, I will say to give Reagan credit, he was already inclined in that direction anyway, but I think it That's right. um, certainly yeah. resonated when, when, when Nixon highlighted it. Yeah. But this is also why, you know, in the first couple of years, uh, you have, you know, Al Haig, who's a very capable secretary of state, but also very much out of step with Reagan and a number of others off doing a lot of his own thing. You've got Dick Allen, very well-intentioned and capable his own way, but not well suited to the national security advisor role. You've got Weinberger starting to assert his territory at the Pentagon. You've got Bill Casey doing what Bill Casey is doing out at CIA. And so uh, so some of the early seeds of foreign policy division and lack of you know clear strategic mandate are there in, the, in 81 and 82. Because Reagan is more focused on on the economy at at, at first, so so that's um, right. yeah, so th that's that's the some of the complexities of that, that first year or two. One other thing I don't want to gloss over as we move to later in the presidency is the 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 seminal event of 1981, the near assassination of Ronald Reagan. Um, yeah. And here, as everybody who ever talks about Reagan has to do, we have to shout out uh, Del Wilbur in his book Rawhide Down, which is an exceptional look at basically that one day and talking to everybody from the, the, the doctors to the secret service agents who were involved. Um, but you, you note that Reagan came out of that experience and noted, I think in his diary that, you know, whatever happens now, I owe my life to God and will try to serve him in every way I can. Now, Reagan's relationship with religion is, um, a, a complicated one in, in some ways, he was not a, uh, a churchgoer every Sunday. He was not somebody who was constantly, you know, thumping his Bible. Um, yet he did appear to have a strong sense of faith um, from childhood forward. But this was the first time in his diary, I think, that he was so direct about my mission in life has changed. I owe everything now. You can read too much into that because there are so many consistencies from before the assassination to after the assassination in terms of his overall strategy and vision. But but you note that there does seem to be more of a focus on certain aspects of especially issues with the Soviet Union and nuclear weapons after that point. So you go with that where you want, but kind of the importance of the assassination, but also tying that into the importance of of faith for Ronald Reagan and how you saw that manifesting in national security decisions or not. Yes, ab absolutely. Very important episode. I mean, first on, on the faith part, that was one of the somewhat surprising revelations from my research is uh, just how deeply committed to his Christian faith Reagan was. And of course, there's as you mentioned, inconsistencies. You know, he's an indifferent churchgoer. He later indulges uh, the First Lady's penchant for astrology, which whatever flavor of Christian you are is usually not consistent with you know, traditional Christianity, <laughs> right? But at the same time, um, uh, I, you know, certainly convinced, I think there's pretty abundant evidence that there is a sincere, deep Christian faith here. I mean, another relating episode from that relating to the assassination attempt is he also writes in his diary um, that as he's lying there on the operating table, you know, struggling for his life in the emergency room at, at GW hospital, he prays that God will forgive that troubled man who tried to shoot him. Um, and Reagan even says, you know, how can I, knowing that God has forgiven me for my sins, how can I uh, hold hold a, a grudge or a resentment against this man who tried to uh, tried to assassinate me? Again, this is a 
personal entry in his diary. Like he's not doing this for for political gain. And then uh, as to his sort of renewed sense of you know almost providential destiny coming out of the assassination, I love that um, uh, excerpt from his diary you read as well about you know uh, God having um, spared him. And then an, another thing he says in the diary right after that. Perhaps having come so close to death made me feel I should do whatever I could in the years God had given me to reduce the threat of nuclear war. Perhaps there was a reason I had been spared. Yeah. Uh, uh, wow. So, and again, and he very quickly tries to turn that into action. Uh, you know, a few weeks after the assassination, as he's you know still recovering um, now back home at the White House, he handwrites that long letter to the Soviet leader uh, Leonid Brezhnev, saying, "Hey, let's sit down and talk. You know, you and I together hold the destiny. You know, the fate of the world in our hands with these nuclear arsenals. <laughs> we need to talk, right?" And Brezhnev so, was it, no Gorbachev, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And Brezhnev, you know, does not uh, does not requite these sentiments very much. But um, and then finally, of course, just two months after Reagan's assassination attempt, the Pope, Pope John Paul II, is also uh, almost dies in an assassination attempt, um, which I think there's decent evidence the KGB was potentially behind. Uh, and that in turn uh, helps forge some of the bond between Reagan and Pope John Paul II with their shared sense of not just anti-communism, but a uh, kind of a divine destiny behind, behind that too. So yeah, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different themes come together in the, those fateful moments. You, because you, you mentioned, uh, Brezhnev, um, there are so many issues we could talk about around the entire world. And I do want to hit several of them, but the, the main one really is Reagan's evolving relationship with Soviet leaders um, how his overall vision stayed the same, you know, his goal stated early on was, well, we, we want to win the cold war. Um, and how do you want to win the cold war? You know, we want to, you know, we, we want to show the Soviet union for what it is, um, yeah. both in, both morally, ethically, um, but also in terms of its ability to provide for its people economically and politically. Mm -hmm. So th those themes are there, but his way of getting there certainly changes from the rhetoric of uh, 1982, 1983 to sitting down with Gorbachev and becoming, dare I say, friendly with him mm -hmm. over oh, the yeah. course of many in-person meetings. So talk a little bit about that dynamic, about how Reagan in some ways grew as an individual, even though his goals stayed the same. Yeah. Oh, thanks for asking that because it's a very important part of the book. And here's where I... Um, do you say, you know, there is a view among some scholars and some analysts that there was a uh, so-called Reagan reversal, that he's a hardliner during his first term and then becomes more accommodationist and peace seeking in, in the second term. And I I pretty clearly reject that in the book. I, I see rather, uh, you know, consistent uh, strategic principles throughout his eight years, again, of applying both pressure and outreach to the Soviets. That's why I mentioned, you know, in in early 81, he's writing these um you know, outreach these uh, endearing letters to Brezhnev. Like, uh, you know, that is not what a, a pure, only anti-Soviet hardliner hard, hardliner would do. And then, of course, in the second term, he's also taking measures uh, you know, such as, you know, supporting the Mujahideen in Afghanistan or deploying the INF missiles in, in Europe uh, that are still hardline on, on the Soviets. And yet he is regularly calibrating and recalibrating these two strands of pressure and outreach in response to what he is getting back from from the Soviet Union, you know, and when their Soviet leaders are not requiting his his outreach appeals, that he doubles down on the more hardline rhetoric and policies. But then once Gorbachev comes along, he leans much more into the outreach strand. You know, he pushes you know pushes harder on the outreach pedal rather than the, if you will, the the, the pressure pedal. Um, but here's where another uh, I think revelation from my research, which I was surprised at, uh, but I think it's you know it's pretty abundant evidence in the the now you know declassified archival documents. I hope readers will pay heed to this one. Is from early on, even from '81, Reagan's clear that part of his strategy is pressuring the Soviet Union to produce a reformist leader. Mm -hmm. to produce a reformist leader that he can negotiate with. Uh, and, and that's why he does that outreach to Brezhnev and Andropov and Chernyenko, hoping that they will be that reformist leader, but they, they certainly are not. He has that uh, famous line, I you know, wanted to negotiate with a Soviet leader, but they keep dying on me. And, and true, <laughs> in, three, in three years, three of them die in rapid succession, symbolizing, of course, the sclerosis and rot of the Soviet, Soviet system. But uh, 
So, but once Gorbachev comes to power in March of 85, I title that chapter in my book, Waiting for Gorbachev, because Reagan had been looking for and waiting for a Gorbachev uh, or someone like him for over over four years. Uh, now, Gorbachev coming to power is mostly a product of the Soviet system itself, uh, of internal Politburo dynamics. I, I'm not giving Reagan complete credit for that, but I will give him partial credit because it's very clear that that was one strand of his policy is pressuring that system, not just to weaken it, not just to deter it, but to strengthen the hand of the reformers, to produce a reformist leader. And this is why, in turn, Reagan embraces Gorbachev as a negotiating partner, a potential partner for peace and reducing the threat of nuclear war. He embraces him much earlier than most foreign policy experts, uh, certainly than most, uh, most, most other Republicans do. And he takes quite a bit of quite a bit of heat for that. But he he embraces Gorbachev because he'd been looking for him. And when you're looking for something, you're more apt to find it. So to kind of follow through on that, once Gorbachev comes in and there's, you know, there's Geneva, there's uh, Malta, Reykjavik, Washington, Moscow, right? There's, there are interactions here, but probably the one that's most interesting is Reykjavik because you've got them, and I've been to the house that they they have north of Reykjavik and the north side of Reykjavik looking out over the ocean. And it's, it's kind of got that sense very different than meeting in one of their respective capitals, right? That it takes you out of place. It takes you out of your role and puts you in a different place to, to reflect on things. And at Reykjavik, they actually came pretty close to making a very dramatic decision about nuclear weapons. But Reagan's, dare I say, faith in missile defense, in SDI, got in the way and mostly because of the word, you know, laboratories. Um, talk talk through that and reflecting on some of the information that has come out, the interviews you did. Um, how close do you think we actually were? Was it literally one sentence or one word away from essentially trying to roll back all nuclear weapons? Or is that something that we've almost mythologized over the years? Yeah, no, David, I think the former is true. I really did, do think it came that close. Um, and boy, uh, again, a lot to say in Reykjavik. I'm, uh, first, I do want to encourage uh, our listeners. Uh, I hope you'll buy and read my book. But uh, if, if you do or if you don't, I want to recommend another wonderful book by Ken Edelman, Reagan at Reykjavik. It came out a few, few years ago. Ken was there personally as the um, head of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. So he was in the room with Reagan for most of it. It's, uh, uh, it's an incredibly well-written kind of memoir and also piece of piece of scholarship. And I, I certainly benefited from it in, in my research too. The other thing to say is I know that there are quite a few uh, foreign policy professionals who listen to this podcast, uh, you know, some of our fellow members of our tribe. I'll say uh, with Reykjavik, don't try this at home. Okay, so this is not the way to do superpower symmetry. <laughs> this is a yeah, so. certainly his advisors were um, not happy with him. Let's say because of his, uh, I don't know what you say, um, going out on the ledge a bit. Oh yeah, yeah, in every possible way. I mean, first of all, you know the the preparation for the summit. Usually these things take six months. They do it in about two weeks, right? I mean, it's a very last minute decision uh, to agree to meet with Gorbachev. Gorbachev there. It's initially not even billed as a summit, but more of a uh, pre-summit summit. You know, it's going to be a preparatory meeting for later doing a real, real summit sometime in the next year. Um, Henry Kissinger, who I, you know, otherwise hold in very high regard, writes a cover story for Newsweek tour that comes out two or three days before Reykjavik, essentially saying this thing is going to be a disaster. Reagan is ill-served to even be doing this. He's not ready for it. Uh, you haven't had the months of elaborate pre-negotiations to have some deliverables teed up, uh, to have the you know the stagecraft choreographed and everything. This is the leaders of the two most powerful countries in the world, two nuclear armed superpowers, uh, you know, still at the apex of their tensions. Uh, you know, each flying uh, you know across the ocean to this you know uh, this, you know obscure house on this you know small island nation on the edge of the earth uh, to kind of wing it. Uh, really. Um, and that's why it's such a fascinating episode. And, um, and so over their, their two days together, they're, uh, they're, you know, nose to nose, knee to knee in the negotiating room. And this is where you really see it becomes an interesting example of leadership because, you know, neither Reagan nor Gorbachev is working off, uh, you know, pre-scripted talking points or, you know, you know, elaborately choreographed uh, scripts that their, their staff have put together. They are both speaking from the heart. They both know the issues very well at this point. Uh, they both are men of firm convictions. And, 
uh, you know, Gorbachev had set the scene initially with some pretty audacious proposals for uh, for arms cuts, you know, uh, reducing the number of Soviet and American nuclear, nuclear missiles. But then they quickly start trying to outdo each other. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, reading the transcripts and talking to people who are there in the room, it's this palpable sense of, oh my goodness, we, this is unprecedented in history. These two leaders racing out, do each, each other, not in protecting their militaries and their, their arsenals, but looking to eliminate the most lethal weapons and Reagan, you know, first it's going to be, let's cut the number of our arsenals in half. Then it's going to be, okay, well, let's eliminate all the nuclear missiles. Then it's, let's eliminate all nuclear warheads entirely. Right. And, and, and Reagan's one run really, really pushing that. Gorbachev says, yes, let's let's do it. But then, as you point out, it all falls apart. Not a single meaningful agreement is reached, even though these very audacious proposals are being put on the table. And I think both leaders really, really meant them. Why? Why does it fall apart? It's over the strategic defense initiative. You know, Reagan's um, envisioned missile defense shield and that word laboratory. Uh, and for you know, background for our, our listeners, uh, not all of whom I think will, you know, can be expected to be specialists in this. Uh, in 1983, three years, three and a half years before the before Reykjavik itself, Reagan had kind of totally upset the strategic balance in the Cold War by proposing, hey, instead of outracing each other with offensive weapons and building up bigger and bigger arsenals and outracing each other with new ways to kill people, how about if we try to compete on new ways to save lives? Uh, uh, and to make these nuclear weapons obsolete. And so he says, I'm, I'm ordering a big research uh, endeavor on uh, new ways to defend against nuclear missile attack, and it'll be the Strategic Defense Initiative. Uh, and it, its critics deride it as, as Star Wars. Um, now, uh, uh, you know, a few things to say there. First, Reagan, as a product of California, of course, you know, the home of Silicon Valley, as an innate optimist, really believed in American ingenuity and American technology and innovation. And he hoped or thought that maybe over decades that something like this, a missile defense system, could actually be built. Uh, it was you know, widely ridiculed at the time. Reagan was enough a realist. He didn't think it was going to be done during his presidency. He just wanted to put the, put the plans in motion. But most scientists at the time didn't think it could work, and so therefore they opposed it. A lot of the arms control community actually feared it would work, and they also opposed it because it would be so upsetting to mutual assured destruction and that balance of terror. And you know, we can which, which was it. kind of Reagan's point, right? That's the whole point. Yeah, exactly. Mutually assured destruction was morally horrific to him. Morally horrific, yeah, exactly. And he'd been a longtime critic of that. Um, but still, most people, even in Reagan's administration, certainly most experts, don't think something like this could actually be operational. But Gorbachev did. Gorbachev is also very respectful of American technology and fascinated by it. And he sees that a key reason why the Soviet Union is losing the arms race is not just about funding, you can throw more money at it, but that the next generation of American weapon systems so outpace anything the Soviets have. You know, uh, stealth technology, advanced command and control and guidance systems, um, uh, you know, much better sonar for our subs. And we, we can, you know, we can do a whole nother show just on the American defense modernization. But the key is Gorbachev is terrified of this thing because he knows that uh, one area of military advantage the Soviets have over the United States is a much larger, more potent, lethal uh, ICBM force. And SDI, if it becomes operational, will completely neutralize that. And so he is desperate to stop SDI. Every summit meeting he has with uh, with Reagan, they're they're haggling over it in Geneva. Gorbachev just berating Reagan, "You've got to get that," you know, and threatening him, saying, "We're going to blow it up. We're going to smash your shield." And Reagan, partly because he genuinely believes in it, and partly because he sees, ah, if Gorbachev is afraid of this, then it must mean something, and it must be a strength for us. Wants to hold on to it. Okay, so back to Reykjavik. Gorbachev says, "Okay, I'm willing. We will eliminate all nuclear weapons as long as you give up SDI." And Reagan says, no, 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 no. I will not give up SDI. And Reagan makes actually a, a coherent argument here. This is not just stubbornness. He says, listen, even if the U.S. and Soviet Union eliminate all of our nuclear weapons, what about if a rogue state bad actor gets a hold of them? And he cites Mo Markadofi in Libya. That's what you later know, you know, did, did pursue nuclear weapons. He says, we need to have this capability to defend ourselves. And Reagan says, look, if we, the United States, get this technology developed, we'll give it to you, the Soviets. We'll share it with you, right? We're not trying to pull one over you on you or get a first strike advantage. It will share it with you. Gorbachev, you know, skeptical, do doesn't believe that. And so Gorbachev says, I will only agree to let you, you know, keep your SDI research if you confine it to the laboratory. You know, no field testing, essentially, no real experiments with it. Right. And Reagan says, no, 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 we, we just can't do that. We need to at least have the capability to, to test this thing and see if it'll work. 
So they go round and around and around. Will it be confined to the laboratory or not? And Gorbachev is so dead set on, on stopping the program, on confining it to the laboratory, that he will not agree to do the big nuclear weapons deal. And Reagan, again, is so dead set and holding on to SDI that he also won't either. And so the summit, break, even after they extend it for several more hours, the summit breaks up. Both leaders walk out. The photographs from the aftermath are so poignant because you see these you know, embittered, ashen-faced, discouraged, despondent, demoralized uh, to to heads of, heads of state. The media is ridiculing Reagan, saying this is you know shows his weakness. This is a disaster for him, and and it is seen as an abject failure. And yet now we can look back and see that out of Reykjavik do come the seeds of what become the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, and several other major advances in what become, you know, the eventual peaceful end, end of the Cold War. Um, mm-hmm. And how did that happen? It's because both leaders realized each the other guy is willing to make uh, audacious, politically courageous, transformative steps. And even if it falls apart at Reykjavik, we know now that we're both serious about ending the threat of nuclear war and bringing this Cold War to an end. Another thing that Reagan presses Gorbachev on is the issue of religious freedom and especially uh, religious dissidents, other dissidents, but especially religious um, dissidents. And this is something that uh, you research and write about. Uh, I still feel like it's almost undervalued looking back because what it, what that does to the Soviet Union, it's one thing if the Soviet Union and the United States exchange in a spy swap which they had done for decades. It's you caught one of ours, we caught one of yours, you know, we, we, we exchange that's, that's transactional, but it's something else when the Soviet union de facto admits, yeah, there is such a thing as freedom of conscience and we have to release these people and it's the right thing to do. And then they get praised for it. The fact that that opens up the eyes in so many, so many ways, it opens up the eyes of the people, inside the Soviet Union and the people in the satellite states. And it has an effect far beyond those individuals. It has an effect that exposes some of the fundamental contradictions of the the communist system. So talk through that a bit. Talk through Reagan's views on religious freedom, particularly related to the Soviet Union and the importance that that had in helping to end the Cold War. Yeah, uh, supremely important. Uh, So one of the key reasons for why Reagan was so, you know, fiercely opposed to Soviet communism and saw it as so thoroughly evil was because of its atheism. Uh, it, it would just uh, was, you know, repellent to him that the system would officially enforce atheism, deny its citizens even the, you know, the right to believe in God or a higher power, let alone to gather and worship or anything like that. But he also saw that as a key source of the Soviet Union's vulnerability. He said, look, there's just something perverse about a society that will, uh, as an official policy, deny the existence of God, especially, of course, with the historic religiosity of, of Russia, the Russian Orthodox Church, as well as, uh, you know, Protestants and Catholics behind the Iron Curtain and Jews, especially Jews. And Reagan was you know, particularly focused on the plight of, uh, plight of Soviet, Soviet Jewry. And so he devoted considerable diplomatic time and capital and his own personal energy to, uh, you know, supporting these peaceful religious dissidents behind the Iron Curtain, especially, you'd say, you know, um, solidarity and uh, dissident Catholics in, in Poland, Lutheran. In, in East Germany, uh, Baptists in Romania, and especially Christians and Jews in the so- Soviet Union itself. And he would often, uh, you know, when he was meeting with Soviet experts or uh, or recent dissidents uh, who'd been, you know, he was high, he'd ask him, tell me about religious conditions. Uh, I, I hear that more and more people want to be- want to go to church. They want to believe in God. They're, they're reading contraband Bibles. And so he was hearing these accounts of this resilient uh, spirituality uh, in the Soviet Union. He wanted to do all he could to support it. Partly as a humanitarian gesture, partly as a fellow religious believer himself, and partly as a way to further weaken that that, bar- that barbaric system. Um, so, uh, but in turn, uh, he he really was committed to uh, doing this in the context of an effort to you know improve the overall U.S. Soviet relationship, and so that's why he would often tell 
uh, Gorbachev or other Soviet leaders he's um, he's negotiating with, such as Anatoly Dobrynin, the Soviet ambassador. Look, if you release this list of you know you know ten or fifteen Christian and Jewish dissidents who are in the Gulag right now or uh, in prison in, in Moscow, uh, if you release them as a favor to me in the United States, we won't crow about it. We won't say anything public. We won't embarrass you. And so he also used it as a way to build build some trust. Um, and if you read the transcripts of his meetings with Gorbachev, yeah, a lot of the time is on. Um, uh, bilateral relations and arms control in Afghanistan, but a lot of the time is spent on the plight of uh, human rights and religious freedom. And it drove Gorbachev crazy. You know, Gorbachev knew deep down that this is a sign of his society's weakness, that it needs to persecute and torment and restrict its own religious believers. Or in the case of a lot of the Soviet Jews, restrict their freedom to emigrate to Israel. You know, that was a uh, that was a big cause that, that many of them were, were working for. And so Gorbachev became very, very sensitive and, and irascible about it. Yeah, over time, Gorbachev have came to appreciate that this was not just an instrumentalist policy by Reagan. He really believed this stuff, especially, you know, at their their final major summit meeting in Moscow in May of 1988. Reagan spends a good part of the time personally appealing to Gorbachev to believe in God. Uh, th this is beyond any policy questions. And Reagan speaks very humbly and movingly about his um, despair at his own son's atheism. And he's trying to tell Gorbachev, you know, I, I really think you'll have a better life if you believe in God, if you allow your, your people religious freedom. And Gorbachev isn't persuaded. I think most evidence is he stays a, an atheist until his, his recent death. But um, he realizes this guy, Reagan, who I'll now call my friend Reagan, uh, he genuinely believes this stuff and he genuinely, genuinely cares. This is not just political opportunism. And one final little vignette I uncovered in my research, which was revealing to me about just how much this personally mattered to Reagan, is his last meeting with Gorbachev while in office is in December of 1988. It's during the presidential transition. So George, Vice President Bush is now is now President-elect Bush. Gorbachev comes to New York uh, to address the UN General Assembly, makes a very you know bold per, uh, proposal for reducing Soviet conventional forces in Eastern Europe. And then uh, he and Bush, President-elect Bush, and you know outgoing President Reagan go to Governor's Island for kind of a celebratory lunch. Not much of an agenda on policy. You know, it's that awkward moment of Reagan is still officially president, but he's not going to do any new policy measures. Uh, he wants to hand that over to, over to Bush. And so it's mostly just a, a time of nostalgia, of reflections, of, of wishing each other well. And towards the end of the meeting, Reagan hands Gorbachev a list of 12 more Jewish refuseniks in the Soviet Union and says, hey, as a personal outgoing favor to me, can you please let these 12 go, let them out of prison, let them emigrate to Israel? Um, and, and Gorbachev agrees to do it. And I bring that up because nobody in the media knows this. Reagan's out of office. This is this is. There's no political gain to be had at all. And they're they're not supposed to even be doing any policy issues at this final meeting. And yet Reagan was so personally committed on on that issue that he still uses that final moment, his last couple of weeks in office. Let's get 12 more people free. Absolutely. Well, I want to run something by you that I've been thinking about and maybe changing my views on. Uh, with Reagan for some time. So on the one hand, I've had the idea that, you know, the Cold War, and I think I've said this in multiple occasions, um, Reagan and then Bush following up on it with his policy, the Cold War ended without, you know, a shot being fired um, in anger between the two superpowers. And technically, at, at, at some level, that's right, right? We did not have an actual third world war in Europe involving uh, Americans and Soviet troops going at each other. But over time, I've come to realize that really does minimize the, the true human cost of the proxy wars around the world. Um, and you can you know, pick almost any continent and you've got them. And that, that hits a different side then of Reagan's legacy. So tell me about that. Tell me about if, if we focus so much on what went right. And to be fair, a lot went right with Reagan's management of Gorbachev personally, of the Soviet Union uh, as a whole. But is there something lost if we focus so much on that, that we we minimize some of the decisions, some of the ethical trade-offs, as you call them, the hard choices of geopolitics that did lead to so much suffering and planted the seeds for so much future conflict in other parts of the world? Yeah. No, thank you for asking this. And and I hope readers will see that I tried to give this a pretty extensive treatment in my book. And I even highlight one of the interpretive themes in the introductory chapter is tragedy in, in the tragic sense of 
for most, uh, almost every every American Cold War president, certainly for Reagan, you're often presented with uh, a, a unpalatable set of choices, uh, none with any perfectly good outcomes. You know, all of them involving trade offs, moral compromises, and then also the other part of tragedy, of course, is just the tragic outcomes, the human carnage, the incredible suffering. Right? You know, the hundreds of thousands of victims um, of proxy wars and military governments, and frankly, communist oppression in Central and South America. Um, uh, uh, you know, our kind of strange uh, quasi alliance of convenience with the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, uh, some of the legacies of our support for the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, right? Again, you know, very key in, in imposing brutal costs on the Soviet occupiers, but, you know, leads, you know, somewhat directly to later the rise of Al Qaeda too in, in the 9 11 era. I mean, so. Um, but a, a few few reflections on that. And again, I hope readers will explore it more deeply in the book. First is, going back to something I said earlier, uh, World War II is such a formative experience for Reagan's foreign policy worldview. Even though he's he's 4F, he doesn't serve in combat himself, uh, but he, you know, he's making training films stateside. But he sees the importance of American leadership against totalitarianism, you know, not you know, German Nazism and imperial Jap- Japanese aggression back then, later Soviet communism. He sees the importance of allies. And here's the key thing: he sees the need for moral trade-offs. And you know, it bears recalling that. A key part of the Allied victory over the Soviet Union in, oh, excuse me, over Nazi Germany in World War II is providing billions of dollars in financial and military aid to one of the most oppressive re- regimes in human history, Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union. Um, and uh, there's a, you know, stomach churning moral compromise involved in doing that. I think it was the right thing to do because we had to defeat the greater evil of, of German Nazism. But that, Reagan's very aware of that. And so fast forward 40 years, he's now president. He's trying to bring the Cold War to a peaceful end. He sees the Soviet Soviet communism as the primary foe. And meanwhile, he uh, is looking at, uh, you know, a number of these, you know, pretty brutal right wing military dictatorships, especially in Asia and Latin America, a little bit in, in, um, in, in, in Africa, too who at least are anti-communist, are generally aligned with American geopolitical interests, but are otherwise brutal regimes uh, that are brutal to their own people, that are massacring peaceful dissidents um, uh, and even, even innocent civilians. And so he makes, in most places, the moral compromise, the strategic calculation, we're going to continue to support those regimes because at least they're anti-communist. Uh, and again, it's it's a very troubling set of choices. In some particular cases, I think it's the wrong choices. But uh, he's doing that, I think, for an understandable reason. He thinks that the greater menace, the greater evil is Soviet communism and its, and its support for these proxy regimes, certainly which in the aggregate uh, contributes to even more human suffering and oppression. But the other key thing, and this is something I was surprised at in the book, is while Reagan arrives in office wanting to you know, distance himself from some of Carter's pressure on American-backed uh, military dictatorships, within uh, uh, between Reagan's first and second year in office, he starts to make a change himself. And I can, if we want to go into more details on this, but the main outlet features of this, he realizes that for the sake of strategic clarity and moral principle, The United States needs to be more consistent in its support for human rights and democracy. And so he no longer continues unconditionally supporting these right wing military dictatorships. Rather, he tries this very delicate diplomatic two step of providing continued backing to them in their anti communism, while also pressuring, nudging, cajoling, encouraging, you know, each context is different them to respect human rights and eventually transition to democracy. And George Schultz is a key partner in this. And, uh, you know, the pr- proof in a lot of ways is in the outcomes, right? So El Salvador then, you know, transition, you know, holds free and fair elections, continues to have some troubles, of course. But um, Reagan and Schultz are able to marginalize the right wing, you know, brutal uh, uh, m- militias and, and death squads uh, and support the Christian Democrats in the Philippines, uh, uh, easing out Marcos uh, and allowing a peaceful democratic transition in South Korea in 87, easing out the Chun dictatorship, uh, uh, supporting peaceful democratic transition. They do this in Taiwan. They do it in Chile with essentially telling Pinochet, uh, you no longer enjoy unconditional American support. 
thank you for your anti-communism. It's time to go. It's time to step down and allow multi-party democracy. And uh, and so I think that is a very important part of the Reagan record and his effort to not just criticize Soviet communism, but support a morally consistent, uh, better alternative of a free world of, of market democracies and bring American values and American interests a little bit more in, in, in alignment. You you had a remarkable um, research process here that we mentioned earlier, not just digging through many different archives, but speaking with a lot of people who were in the administration from Frank Carlucci to, to George Schultz. One person you didn't get a chance to talk to, of course, was Ronald Reagan, who was deceased by the time you were doing the research. So I wonder if you did have the chance to talk to him and get his best attempts at honest, reflective answers, what are the key questions that you you still have for Ronald Reagan himself about the formulation of his beliefs, about the execution of his strategy, about regrets in national security and foreign policy? Uh, what would you want to get out of him? Oh, boy, that's a that's a great question. Um, uh, a couple of big picture things I'll I'll mention, and then uh, and then a couple of specific details episodes in the book that are still somewhat somewhat mysterious to me. Um, first, on the big picture, uh, I would I would love to hear from him. When and how did he, it, or did he ever, uh, by the time he left office, get a sense that the Soviet Union was about to fall apart? I see indications, yeah. I, there are strong indications he is pushing for that. He wanted that to happen. That was his goal. I think that's very clear. But uh, did he actually think it was going to happen within a, you know, first of the Berlin Wall would come down less than a year after he leaves office and then the Soviet Union would crumble, you know, less than less than, less than three years, three years later. Um, how much did he specifically foresee these these policies, these policies working? Um, the the second would be when did he really realize that Gorbachev was this true former he'd been looking for? You know, I, I see some indications in late 85, early, early 86, but, um, uh, you know, putting pieces together from his, from his diary, uh, and, and, and some, some internal memos, but we can't, we can't know that one for sure. Um, so that, that's another one. The third would be picking up on what we, um, we're just talking about. I map out over, I think, a nine-month period from October 81 to June of 82 when he undergoes this transition from backing right-wing uh, military governments because they're anti-communist to being more consistent on democracy promotion. This culminates in his June of 82 Westminster Address. But I, some of it is me filling in some of the gaps in the, you know, I've got the data points, but I'm, you know, connecting some of the dots here. I'd love to hear his his deeper reflections on that, his own thought process on that, because he, he doesn't change his mind on much during his eight years in office. But that is something I think he does change his mind on. Um, then a, a specific episode, which I explored a lot in the book, um, uh, but there's still some mystery to it, uh, is in uh, October of 83, when there's that awful moment when Hezbollah, Hezbollah terrorist um, a, a suicide bomber blows up the Marine barracks in Beirut, kills yeah. 241 American Marines, another 60 or so French French peacekeepers. Hmm. And then there's the big internal debate, should Reagan order retaliatory strikes? Uh, and, and then he doesn't order retaliatory strikes. Um, and it continued to be a source of great division and acrimony among his advisors for, for decades afterwards. And there's competing accounts about whether he did order it and, and, and Weinberg did didn't follow through or not. I would love to just find out from him what exactly was he thinking on that. Um, did he uh, actually order them and they weren't carried out? I don't think that's the case. Uh, did he? Why did he not order them? Uh, understand that. I I think it was a mistake that he didn't order them. But that's uh, that's another one of those um, not fully solved mysteries. I'm gonna I'm gonna add one more, and I, I think I got to it primarily from reading your book, which is this. And it, I don't think it's resolved. Um, you come down on one side of this, but whether Reagan was intending through his, the evolution of his administration, whether he was intending to get a reformer in the Soviet Union and actually get to an end of the Cold War because the Soviet Union would, in, in a sense, improve its behavior, uh, or whether his his deep plan all along was to undermine the Soviet Union so much that it literally would fail. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure it matters because some of the things he did, you know, go towards the same uh, until the very end branch point. Um, but I think it would be interesting to find out, was he thinking at that level or was he just 
you know, running with his instinct and his faith that this was just the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a very big one. I mean, um, the great University of Virginia historian Mel Leffler put this well in an article a few years ago. Did Reagan want to win the Cold War or to end it? Uh, and of course, those are not completely mutually exclusive, but but it's uh, there. There is some some tension there. Um, you know, I take you know, I take a stab at trying to answer that with uh, uh, you know, arguing that Reagan is pursuing a negotiated surrender, which tries right. to bring those two together. Right. But you know, I will admit and that you know it's clear. You know, readers will see that in the book that that is my uh, interpretive framing of it. Reagan mm-hmm. himself never uses that phrase, "negotiated surrender." Um, and we can, mm-hmm. you know, there's there's good evidence to, to emphasize, you know, both the winning and and ending part. Yeah, that'd be another great question for him. You close your book uh, with Reagan's one of his final public addresses um, at the Oxford Union at the end of 1992. And there are some words there that are, in a sense, chilling <laughs> for, for our time. He talks about, and I'll just quote his words, will we squander the moral capital of half a century? Will we turn inward, lulled by a dangerous complacency? And then closing, saying the work of a peacemaker is never complete. Um, seeing what's happened in the last several years um, in the United States, uh, the Republican Party is not the Republican Party that that Ronald Reagan built and and fortified in many ways. Um, when it comes to national security policy writ large, including homeland security issues, including the strength of the United States as Reagan saw it as a moral beacon, um, do you think he would take those words, uh, fearing that we would turn inward, lulled by a dangerous complacency and squander our moral capital? Um do you think that he would be challenged by today's environment in a way that that he wasn't in his own in that sense? Boy, really good question here, and I, um, I, I, I should first say it's it's very uh, treacherous uh, uh, territory for you know someone like me to speculate on what would Reagan think or do today, where he alive today, right? So I, I want to be careful with that. But th- that said, with that caveat, I'll take something of a stab at it. And I'll first say um, what struck me during the research for this book is Reagan's political courage in uh, challenging a lot of the American people and his own uh, conservative base in his own day on uh, certain foreign policy questions. So trade, for example, Reagan is fiercely committed to free trade and open trade. And he was he faced tremendous protectionist headwinds at the time from his own party, as well as from from the Democrats, uh, you know, particularly over U.S. US Japan trade. Uh, It was not politically popular for him to be going out and trying to push open trade policies and uh, and make speeches to the American people on on the on the importance of this. Um, Similarly, you know, one of my favorite spe- favorite speeches of his is, of course, on the 40th anniversary of the Normandy invasion, June 6, 1984, the boys of Point du Hoc, right? Very moving testimonial to the World War II generation. But again, I encourage um, our listeners to go back and read or watch that speech. Reagan also includes in it a very clear warning against isolationism. Um, and he is worried even in the 1980s about recurrent isolationist tendencies among the American people, among his among his own party. Um and he says that, you know, that never was and, you know, never will be, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, a, a credible response to, uh, to to tyranny and to aggression. Uh, and we are over here in Europe so that we don't have to be fight, fighting fighting at home. Uh, so I, uh, I, you know, with, well, you know, there's, of course, these recurrent uh, isolationist and protectionist sentiments among, you know, much of the Republican Party today. And I'm, you know, as a still, you know, someone who is a, who is a Republican, I, I don't like those tens in the party and in my party. I hope with this book, and I wrote it as a pure history, you know, it's not a policy prescription for today, but I hope with it as recapturing, you know, I think uh, some of the distinctives and accomplishments of Reagan's foreign policy, that Republicans today, most of whom, just about every Republican today will will say they revere Reagan or that they think highly of Reagan, you know, almost all of them will, uh, start with that and say, well, um, given that, let's look back at what he actually believed and what he actually did. Um, and I think there, um, there's a compelling message for returning to those values today as good policy, which over time succeeds in practice and thus is good politics. Uh, to go in a different direction here, it wasn't until about 10 years ago with Steven Spielberg's Lincoln 
uh, Daniel Day Lewis playing Lincoln, that I feel like we finally got a great movie about one of our great presidents. Um, I still think we haven't had a great movie about George Washington or mm -hmm. Teddy Roosevelt or some other iconic U.S. presidents. And I'd put Reagan in that category. I cannot think of a great movie about Reagan, even though he was so important for the the latter half of the, the 20th century and for this momentous event, which is ending the Cold War without getting to World War III. Why do you think that is? Why is it so hard to portray perhaps greatness in, in general, but why is it so hard to portray Ronald Reagan um, in popular culture uh, in, in a way that I guess finally was done with Lincoln? But how, why is it so hard with Ronald Reagan? And maybe you disagree with me. Maybe you know of some great portrayals of Reagan that I've missed. No, no. If, if such a portrayal of him on the silver screen exists, I have not seen it either. So yeah, there, there's a huge opportunity there for a, a great movie, a, a, maybe a great TV series uh, to, to be made. And, and I, I hope, hope it'll be done. Why hasn't it been done yet? I'll just offer a few speculations. I don't think there's you know any one part of this. One is Reagan himself, as fascinating as he is, he, he's an elusive character, right? I mean, he's really hard to get to know. He didn't have any close friends other than the, and then the first lady. Uh, and so even though he's living and acting in very dramatic times, getting inside his head and bringing him out as a, as a real person is somewhat hard. I and mean, he exists as this iconic image, sometimes this, this, this caricature. So that, that is hard. Um, uh, the, the second, and I think there's something to this, you know, this might be a little more controversial is overall in Hollywood and the entertainment industry, there's um, not a overwhelmingly favorable uh, disposition towards Republicans and conservatives, right? Um, you know, the few portrayals there have been of Reagan on the silver screen are usually much more of a, of a neg negative slant. Um, uh, you know, there may be some exceptions to this, but I think there's, there's, an, op there's an opening there too. Um, there is maybe um, a lot of his most important accomplishments uh, come through diplomacy, uh, through these speeches, through these summit meetings. Uh, they're not on the battlefield, right? I mean, you know, the, the, so there's not a great Reagan war movie to be made um, mm -hmm. the way, you know, to say you can do with, say, Saving Private Ryan or, uh, or Lincoln, or, or even, you know, obviously I, I love the Lincoln movie too, you referenced, and that does a good job of bringing this out. But of course, the Civil War is going on at, at the time too. So that, that right. may be a little bit of it. But but I still think there's a real there's a real opportunity there. So Maybe our best chance is, and it would pick up in some ways on how Lincoln did it in the those conversational, long conversational scenes of mm -hmm you know, Reagan at Reykjavik, right? Of having oh, yeah. Yeah, Reagan I know. Gorbachev relationship, either focused just on, you know, that house or focused on, you know, Malta and Washington and Moscow, right? But something yeah. about the the relationship between the two of them could be interesting. Um, but then, of course, it gets hard. How do you cast Ronald Reagan when he was an actor himself? That's yeah, that, I should have said that. That's the other one, too. It's like, yeah, you're you're having an actor play play an actor who was, of course, uh, you know, pre president, too. Uh, <laughs> maybe that the, the Churchill movie, uh, uh, Finest Hour, yes. would be another another model for it. So there um, you go. it can be yeah. done, right? Yeah, it can it, be done. It can be done. So. Well, now is the time when we reach into our chatterbox and ask you a random question. Uh, this one I'll modify based on our conversation. Name one dead political or national security related leader from any era, not named Ronald Reagan, that we could really use right now. Oh boy! Um, all right, I, I I will I will come. This will be a Reagan era one. George Shultz. Um, I, you know, I think come and of course he just just you know died what just uh, just a year ago at at, at age one hundred. Um, with apologies to Henry Kissinger and James Baker and some other very notable secretaries of state, I try to make a case in the book for Schultz being, you know, our greatest secretary of state of the modern era, maybe even our greatest one since John Quincy Adams, um, uh, a man of tremendous accomplishment, uh, tremendous integrity. Uh, of course, I spend my time in the book on his time as secretary of state, but he's one of only two Americans in history to have held four cabinet posts. He had also been OMB director, secretary of labor, secretary of the treasury, um, an incredibly iconic life, you know, starts off as a, uh, a Marine in uh, combat for two years in the Pacific theater in World War II, 
PhD from MIT in economics, dean of the Chicago Business School, president of Bechtel. Uh, you know, he really spans the American century. And he is uh, both a incredibly accomplished policymaker and negotiator and also a great manager. I mean, you know, during my time at the State Department, I used to enjoy asking more senior foreign service officers, um, who's the greatest secretary you ever served under? And they would all say George Schultz. And a lot of them would say, "No, I'm a Democrat. I didn't vote for Reagan, but it was, but it was, it was, it was George Schultz." Uh, so that I think that uh, combination of integrity, character, capability, uh, devotion to service um, is is something much uh, that we could use use more of today. And so I I hope in a small way this this book will help to burnish the Schultz legacy and encourage a closer look at his life and career. Well, I definitely appreciate that answer. And I appreciate your your time with us talking about all of this. Will, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, David. It's been a real honor. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Chatter.